Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Today we are looking at A-level psychology with the optional module of eating behaviour. Just before we jump in, um, please feel free just to subscribe to my channel if you find this video useful. Um, I also have a ton of other A-level psychology videos on my channel. Um, I'm going to be working through all of the optional topics so that they'll all be up for you as well as compulsory topics. And I also have some sociology and chemistry content up there as well for A-level if you happen to study, this, study those subjects as well. But um, and if you have any questions at all, then please feel free to put them in the comments below and I shall just crack on. Starting off with explanations of food preferences. So this is kind of the evolutionary side of things. So evolution is the process by which species adapt to their environment and over many years, random gene mutations become more widespread that aid the survival of the species. You'll know a lot more about evolution from like GCSE biology and things. Um, evolution explains human preferences for different foods. So an example of this is sweet foods are often high in energy, which can store as fat to reduce starvation, whereas poison often has a bitter taste, hence why sweet food is preferred. There's such a thing as neophobia, which is an innate dislike of foods we haven't tried before, which makes sense from an evolutionary perspective, as unfamiliar foods could potentially be poisonous or unhealthy, which can be overcome by learning or repeated exposure. And the repeated exposure is something that Birch et al. in 97, 1987 found when studying, studying children. Then we have taste aversion. So this is when a person develops a dislike for a certain food after becoming ill from it or biological preparedness um, from Seligman in 1971. Um, so this is, yeah, our, this is our body telling us this has made us ill, we don't like it, so we don't want to have it anymore. Um, obviously there is research evidence to support this, but of course like anything and all these kind of explanations, there's always other factors at play. So in terms of this evolutionary, there is, you know, social um, reasoning behind it. And looking at that social, so the learning side of um, food preferences, we have the social influence. So what a child's mother eats during development, so when in the womb, um, affects food preferences for the child, as obviously these nutrients are fed to the baby through the, uh, when they're inside the womb. And then again, through breastfeeding, everything the mother eats gets transferred into that into the breast milk, which the child has. Um, children also observe what parents and other role models eat, which they then imitate, helping to reduce neophobia, social learning. Then we have operant conditioning. So this contributes um, as enjoying the food acts as a positive reinforcement and increases your chances of eating that food again, although it doesn't necessarily create food preferences. Then you also have cultural influence. So there's a lot of cultural things that you need to take into account when it comes to food preferences. So different cultures have different eating behaviours. Um, so certain religions uh, forbid, forbid eating pork, um, an example of this is Judaism, or forbidden eating beef, an example of this is Hinduism. Or, you know, for example, you find different foods in different cultures. So you're going to find you're more likely to find snails in France and a raw octopus in Korea than you will find them in the UK. Obviously, there are useful applications for this in terms of child rearing and also health agencies in different cultures. So if they know that people are more likely to be eating a certain type of food, they can adjust their um, offerings. Then looking at neural and hormonal mechanisms involved in control of eating. So neural mechanisms, so the hypothalamus is the main section of the brain responsible for maintaining homeostasis within the body and controls body temperature, sleep and hunger. There are two sections of the hypothalamus that have opposite effects on eating. You've got the lateral hypothalamus, which is responsible for making you hungry and start eating. And then you have the ventromedial hypothalamus, responsible for making you feel full and stop eating. When blood sugar is low, the liver sends signals to the lateral hypothalamus, which causes neurons to fire that make you feel hungry and start eating. Once you eat, glucose is released into the blood, which is detected by the ventromedial hypothalamus, causing neurons to fire that make you feel satiated or full. Also, I apologise for any spelling errors. Um, you'll just have to bear with. <laughs> um, then looking at hormones, so there's two main hormones when it comes to eating and fe feeling full. Um, so ghrelin is a hormone that makes you feel hungry, secreted by the stomach into the bloodstream, which is detected by the hypothalamus. Once you eat, the stom stomach stops releasing ghrelin, so you no longer feel hungry. 
Then you have leptin, which is a hormone that makes you feel full, secreted by fat cells into the bloodstream, which signals to the hypothalamus that energy storage is high and you don't need to eat. If you don't eat for a while, the body uses these fat deposits for energy, and so those fat cells no longer exist to produce leptin. Now, specifically looking at um, an eating disorder known as anorexia nervosa, typically just tends to be called anorexia, but this is an eating disorder characterised by an obsession with losing weight, body image distortion, um, restricting food consumption and low body weight. Um, one key thing to remember is that low body weight is an, a big part of anorexia, but someone can be anorexic and still have a, a high body weight. But that's just me putting my um, point in. <laughs> um, but the biological explanations for this. So you have genetics. So uh, Holland et al. in 1988 did a twin study and found a concordance rate for anorexia of 56% with identical twins and 5% for non-identical. Bullock et al. in 2006 also estimated heritability is 56% based on analysis of 31,000 pairs of Swedish twins. Then you have gene association studies as well, compared DNA profiles from anorexia suffer sufferers with non-anorexic controls and found genes correlated. So examples of this is OPRD1, HTR1D and EPHX2. So essentially these are all genes that could potentially be a cause or part of the relationship between an individual, whether they develop anorexia or not. Of course, you can see there that there is research support. There is a lot of research into this biological side and how genetics have a role. But of course, the concordance rate isn't 100. So other factors are at play in this situation. Then you have the neural side. So those with anorexia have reduced blood flow to the lateral hypothalamus. But it is unclear whether this is cause or effect of anorexia. So this is where the person, individual doesn't feel as hungry. And none at all in 2011 have proposed that damage to the, I don't think that's meant to be insult, but a cortex of the brain is a key cause of anorexia. Several studies have found correlations between serotonin activity and anorexia, hypothesized by K et al. 2009, that anorexic patients have elevated serotonin activity, which causes anxiety and starvation reduces serotonin levels and therefore anxiety. Baylor et al. 2013 also suggests overproduction of dopamine may also contribute. So again, there's plenty of research support into, support into this, but you have to take into consideration, is this relationship correlational or causational? Like, is some, does it just happen to be correlational or like, was it a cause? It wasn't, yeah. So there's no way to really tell how these relationships play out. Apologies for that. Then the psychological explanations. So you've got the family systems theory. So Minuchin et al. in 1978 proposed this psychodynamic theory that explains anorexia as a result of family dysfunction. And the families of anorexic patients often share four key features. So the first one is enmeshment. So members have no individual identity, but kind of all just blur into one unit. Um, then we have overprotective. So yeah, the family is just very overprotective, very, very controlling. Then you have conflict avoidance. So basically just avoid, it does as it says on the tin, conflict avoidance. They avoid conflict at any opportunity. Uh, then you have rigidity. So the family just do not like change. Brock, apologies if I say anyone's names wrong, by the way. Um, in 1978 suggests anorexia is a way to assert autonomy and control. Obviously, in terms of having a very rigid, overprotected family, the all kind of in this one thing, um, anorexia is a way to kind of challenge that and take control over something. You have practical applications to this, essentially family therapy to support those going through recovery from anorexia. But of course, as always, there's other factors at play, such as biology and also learning. Then you have the social learning theory. So going off that, um, Starting off with modelling, so a person who the anorexic patient either likes or wants to be like. This could be a sibling or a celebrity. Then you have vicarious reinforcement, so they observe the role model being rewarded and praised for being thin, which um, creates motivation to imitate their behaviour and restrict eating. 
The media plays an important part with many celebrities being depicted as slim and that this is desirable um, receiving praise. You also often see a lot of articles, especially in gossip magazines, where they negatively discuss um, celebrity weight gain. You know, you'll see they'll have a paparazzi picture of a celebrity just on a beach, chilling, you know, not sucking in, not posing, just living their life. And they look a little bit chubbier or something because of the fact that they're not posing. And they're, the magazines instantly jump on it. Oh, she's gained, she's gained weight. And it's particularly for females as well. Um, they do it for males a bit. I'm not saying they don't. But the level that they do it, the scrutiny that females face are, is generally a lot more in this kind of example. Again, you have research support, so this comes from Dittmar et al. in 2006. But like always, um, there are other factors at play. Then you have cognitive explanations, so distortions, so an inaccurate perception of body image, also known in its extremes as body dysmorphia, where the individual just cannot see their physical appearance for actually what it is. Uh, then you have irrational beliefs, so these are incorrect, maladaptive and exaggerated thoughts about eating food and gaining weight. So an example of this is, you know, oh, if I eat this packet of crisps, I'm going to become obese. I'm going to become really fat if I eat this. Oh no, I, th I can't have that because it's bad for me, etc. Again, practical applications, so understanding this side of things can help with anorexia treatment. But again, like the other two psychological th um, explanations, there are other factors at play. Then we have the explanations of obesity. So obesity is a physical condition characterised by excess body fat, which can cause health problems um, such as heart disease and diabetes and is the leading cause of preventable death in many countries. In the UK, around 30% of the population is classified as obese. So, so for the biological explanations, we're going to start off with genetics. So Stunkard et al. in 1990 looked at identical male and female twins that had been raised together and raised apart. For those raised together, concordance was 74% and 69% respectively. So the concordance was 74% for males and 69% for females. And for those raised apart, it was 70% and 66% respectively. So this shows you that... Um, Biology is a massive part of it, but environment also has a really big um, play in that situation. Then you have genome association studies. Uh, Four and Ingelson, 2012, found FTO gene is correlated to obesity. But for clarity, genes don't cause obesity, just increase or decrease your risk for it. Again, this has um, practical applications because it can support in treatments for obesity, um, especially if we know kind of why someone is more likely to become obese but again there are other factors at play obviously concordance rates in Stunkard et al's research was not 100% for biology so there's a lot of other things at play then you also have the neural factor so the hypothalamus plays a key role in eating behavior suggesting damage to the ventromedial hypothalamus which can cause obesity um Obesity may also be caused by neurons that do not respond properly to leptin, so that hormone we spoke about earlier. Volkow et al. in 2008 has used brain scans to measure dopamine receptor activity and found obese individuals have reduced dopamine receptor activity and people need to overeat to achieve the same pleasure rewards as a normal individual. Hodge et al. in 2012 also found lower serotonin levels correlated with obesity. Then the psychological explanations just to finish off. So firstly, you have the boundary model. So this was by Herman and Polivy in 1984. So this is essentially where people have biologically set boundaries of food intake. If food falls below a certain minimal level, they feel the aversive feeling of hunger that motivates eating. If it exceeds the maximum level, this causes the aversion of feeling too full. And these levels are determined by, by biology. So this can't be changed by social uh factors or if someone just wants to if like that you can't choose if you feel hungry or full that's just how, how it happens um the range between these levels is the zone of biological difference where psychological factors are more important and you can see a little diagram at the bottom then you have restraint theory so trying to eat less can paradoxically make a person eat more and become obese so a restrained eater will set a self-imposed boundary, which causes the person to think a lot about food 
And when they cross that boundary um, of how much they restrain them, that restraint level they put, um, eating may become disinhibited and they eat until full or way beyond this. Um, and this disinhibited eating can cause obesity. Again, there are practical applications um, for supporting people losing weight, obviously making sure they don't eat too little as well to go on the other side. But again, correlation versus causation in this um, topic. Then we actually look at the factors of why dieting can either be successful or a failure. So a diet is successful if a dieter loses the desired amount of weight and keeps it off long term. Factors that increase your chance of success are realistic expectations. So actually having a sustainable diet and trying to lose weight steadily over a period of months and years. Incentives and motivation, so operant conditioning of reaching a goal and rewarding yourself. Obviously, it's not going to be much fun dieting if you're just doing it without any kind of reward. Uh, social support, so friends and family, if they're actually willing to support you in your diet, um, as suggested by Wing and Jeffrey in 1999. Then relapse prevention strategies as well, so avoid going back to old eating habits. Obviously, if you go on a diet for, I don't know, six months, and then you finally hit your goal weight and then you go back to your old eating habits, you're just going to gain that weight back. So you need to make sure you're building up new habits. But then factors that increase your chance of failure. So an overly restricted diet, such as, you know, a thousand calories a day or like the ones where you fast for like a couple of days and then you eat. Um, or, you know, also having unrealistic expectations. So wanting to lose weight in a really short period of time. Um, you see a lot about, you know, that's like that that eight week like diet before you go on holiday but then obviously that's very short term lot like weight loss of course this has practical applications because you can take these ideas and be like right well I'm going to set myself realistic expectations I'm going to give myself motivation I'm going to try and get that social support and you know like diet programs can recognize that social support is important and also building up those new habits but if, but on the other hand, there's also actual gender bias to a lot of the obesity dieting uh, research because it's mostly done on females, probably one of the few areas of research where it is done mostly on male on females, which means that it may not necessarily apply as strictly to males. But that is everything for today's video. Um, I hope you found it useful. Please, again, subscribe, like the video. So if you found it useful, then other people will know they, that it was found useful and they'll look at it as well. And yeah, comment below any questions you have and I shall see you soon. Bye.